Hi, everybody. So I'm Tiffany, and we are joined by Sean Deneen. He is from New Jersey, and I know he is a professor, which is really cool, and um, he has a disability. So, hey, Sean, how are you? Fine, thank you, and, and th welcome to you all. Thank you all for letting me participate in this. Absolutely. We'd love to talk to every kind of person out there who has a disability to see what their life experience is like. So this is going to be really cool to hear your stories, because I know that you work as a professor, which I don't think we've had anyone on yet who is in that kind of field. So can you share? Well, let's start from your, well, let's start with your disability, if you don't mind. I mean, I, I, see, I see that you have like mobility up above. So are you kind of like a paraplegic? Yes, I have spastic paraplegia from premature birth. Ah, oh, you do. Okay. So that whole life you've lived with this disability then? Yes. Yes, I have. Yes, you have. So were you ever able to walk as a child or was it always right in a wheelchair? Uh, for a very short period, they stopped making the kind of metal brace that I used. Yeah. And yeah. had some surgery that didn't really work, but I'm thankful because my mind is intact and I'm yes. able to communicate and you can get around the physical stuff if you have a good brain. That's why we have, we're doing the show today, but you know, um, you're, how old are you? I am 46. Okay, so you grew up in the 80s, the 70s and the 80s, and went to school then, with pre-ADA though, right? Yes, and, so, and that, that had its own challenges. Uh, um, yeah, I bet it did. I what started it like? off in a separate school for people with mobility problems, cerebral palsy and so on, okay. and then uh, went into the public schools and was in special ed classes um, until I was in a fully inclusive environment when I went to high school. Oh, it took that long. Well, I always had the academic ability, but the the argument was in those days that we were more comfortable with our peers. Right. So which stupid. is kind of a subtle segregation. It's not as direct as racial or gender, but it's no less real. Exactly. I agree with you there. Well, so I, I like to think I, I helped to change that in a small way. I bet you did out there. Um, have you always been out in New Jersey too? Yes, uh, since my early childhood. I was born in Virginia. Uh, my mother went to college down there, and I was lucky because being so premature, they yeah. had the first uh, treatment center for premature babies. Oh, cool! But my mother came back up to New Jersey when I was very young, and I've yeah. been there ever since. Okay. So, what was it like when you went to high school with everyone who was able-bodied? Well. It, it had been a gradual process. I had started going to inclusive classes in the fifth and sixth grade. Mm -hmm. I always enjoyed academics. I mean, I was more of a person. I always, I read from a very early age. I have a almost unique gift. I can read very fast. I can read a thousand page book in 15, 20 minutes. Okay, that's very cool. Yeah, so nice. I've mm -hmm. always been an intellectual person and yeah. So yeah. I enjoyed it. I, I got involved in our debate club, the Model UN, mm -hmm. oh, and cool. uh, became an Eagle Scout, which is a great social and recreational activity. Yeah, oh, fun. And so, what, did you, was there, were, you the, were you the only kid in a wheelchair at your high school? Um, actually, I was one of a few. Okay, uh, good. But uh, we, I was welcomed and, and treated as same as anyone else and expected to do the work with what do they call it? Reasonable accommodations? Yep, reasonable accommodations. You know that. Yep, you're right yeah, on. Uh, I, I've always been blessed. I, I then, then I went to college and, and got a Great. bachelor's and a master's. And okay. Can you tell us, um, can you tell us before, how did you decide to do a master's in the, the field that you did? And you ended up teaching, right? Well, I, I, wanted, I, I wanted to teach and um, I had some trouble with the certification exams for high school teaching because mm -hmm. I have very poor math skills. I'm a liberal arts person. Yeah, me too. <laughs> you had to take every subject and math. I, I can do the four operations, but that's about it. I can't handle trigonometry and algebra and all of that. That's terrible so, stuff. Um, mm -hmm. I, I got a master's okay. at Kane University where I work. Cool, cool. And then I got a PhD a few years ago. No way. All right. So... That's crazy. I always be so nervous to, to teach. I mean, is that what you're doing exactly? Are you going in front of a class and teaching? Yes. And frankly, I love it. 
You do. Okay, we got to talk about this. This is so interesting to me. I'm such a shy, I do these podcasts, but to be in front of a class of what, how many people do you teach at a time? Um, as this past semester before the virus, I had 37. Wow. And what age are college students, right? Yeah. Or... Uh, these are mostly freshmen and sophomores. It's a required world history course. Okay. Wow. That's cool. Well, I've had students of all ages. There was a woman in her 60s who decided to go back to school. Nice, nice. It was I, like I just love it because um, I found that sometimes people assume we have difficulty communicating. So exactly. I'm, I love a job where I basically get paid to talk. <laughs> and this, I bet you world history is actually a pretty cool um, course. I love history. I would love a world history class. So, you know, when you, you start your first semester day one, since this podcast is about people not really thinking we can do what we can I, do you ever have any students that are like wait a second here well, when you come in I, they are a little surprised and mm -hmm. i encourage them to ask questions if they are curious i love that you should mm -hmm. and what 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 was a bit of a challenge in getting the doctorate um yeah oh that, sorry That's that okay. took forever You're that real took life. forever because mm -hmm. um I had to do some international traveling and that was very expensive. Oh, really? And the assumption was that disability organizations, United Cerebral Palsy, the MDA, uh, mm -hmm. vocational rehab would finance everything and they don't do that. Oh no, yeah, that's a lot of money. I, I, I am in debt up to my eyeballs, but it's worth it. Oh yeah, where did you go? Well, for the doctorate, I went to Drew University in, in Madison, New Jersey. Okay, okay. How and where did I travel? I yeah. traveled to Australia and South Africa. Oh my gosh. And you're because wheelchair? I was doing research on disability inclusion during the Cold War. Oh my God. How interesting. Really? And ironically, mm -hmm. uh, to give you a bit of knowledge, South Africa, even in the apartheid segregationist era of the 1960s, was a pioneer in disability inclusion. How so? Well, um, one of the white prime ministers had a niece who had polio right before the vaccine so he got the business community together said i want this country to become accessible for what were then called handicapped people yeah and you have six months to do this and i don't care what it costs but if it doesn't get done you're all being shot <laughs> i mean i don't approve of the violence at all but wow really they, they certainly got it accomplished so they installed what curb cuts and ramps and oh, all the curb facilities. Cuts, braille elevators, uh, uh, quotas in government departments, sort of like affirmative action, but for disabilities. Are you kidding me? No way. And, That's and not crazy. not answering phones either. Policy positions. Every every department of the government has to have a minimum of five to ten percent of people with disabilities in executive positions. That's so cool! Wow, and that all started in the apartheid era. Yes, in the in 1960s, um, okay. with the help of a prime minister they had at the time, a man named Hendrik Verwood, okay. and Nelson Mandela's cousin, who was in charge of one of the separate tribal homelands that they set up for the African community at that time. I mean, I'm certainly not defending apartheid, but oh, it's no, an irony of history yeah. that something like that happened. How interesting. No, everyone always thinks the United States was the beginning of the disability, um, you know, accessibility movement. Well, we certainly played our role. In fact, a dear friend of mine mm -hmm. um, filed the first lawsuit in California under the ADA's predecessor, the Rehab Act, because oh, she yeah? was labeled bounds and oh. put in a, a workshop in an institution and sued to become a dance instructor. Oh my gosh. Wow. And how did she win? Yes. And, and she became an advocate and a dance instructor and a wonderful mentor of mine that if oh. you, you do any more of these you might want to talk to her what's her name her name is karen lynn Kloop. karen lynn Kloop. i don't know her i haven't heard of her that's so cool i love to hear stories like that absolutely i will get her information later we'll have her on the Certainly. show uh, so uh, now that i've given you my basic background is there anything else you want to ask well the main thing as we we want to know i think because this is, we're trying to stay up on topic, even though your life is crazy cool. And I love that you're a teacher, but this is kind of about how our people, you know, 
responding to you as a man who's a professor in life and doing your thing. And we all have these crazy stories where people are shocked. Oh, that we're I have a few of those. Um, That's what I we wasn't want. Sure how far yeah. you wanted me to go with that? But. Well, you know what? Let's take some. Let's take a story into. Let's. I'd love to hear one if you want to flesh okay. one out. Okay. Yeah. I, I, I will. I will tell you one rather amusing and sad story at the same time. Okay. I was in a restaurant and a person came up to me and they wanted to know whether I was allowed to be out that time of night. Wow. <laughs> because apparently we're all under curfew and you're not allowed to associate <laughs> the same way as able-bodied folks. Oh my gosh. That's Their exact really words annoying. were, quote, are you people allowed out this time of night? Wow. How old was she? Was she young or old herself? Um, I'd say maybe late 40s. I mean, not very young, but certainly not yeah. ancient. She's Louise's. That's terrible. What'd you say? I made a very sarcastic remark. I said I was being rewarded for having shaved that day, so I was allowed to go out because of shaved. <laughs> I, I tend to respond with humor and sarcasm because anger however justified is often right. dismissed as tantrum throwing it's you not taken that. seriously no you're right that's the right way to do it yeah but especially I, have even, I have an even more bizarre story okay let's hear it yeah and I, I i have to preface this it's going to sound so weird you're going to think i made it up but i swear to god this happened i well we believe you i believe you I'm, hopefully everyone i'm in another you. facility and i'm eating and a woman asks, uh, do I have paralysis? And is that why I'm in a wheelchair? Oh, like yeah. it's injured or something? Now, mm -hmm. that's a legitimate question. Yeah, yeah. So I said, yes, I have spastic paralysis, which is a form of cerebral palsy. Yep. Well, without any sort of warning or reasoning, this woman suddenly puts her hand on my face. Oh, no. And turns me to face her. <laughs> oh, no. now you you will you're really going to be i'm glad you're sitting down because if you were <laughs> you'd faint and you'd oh you're funny <laughs> so her hand is on my chin on my face and i this happens so fast i don't know what's going on oh no so she suddenly proceeds to stick a tongue depressor down my throat the way a doctor what no. so help but yes. why? So I'm sitting there trying not to be violent, but wondering, you know, I, I want to get this person off me. And I certainly can't communicate with this device in my mouth. <laughs> this is crazy. So she finally let go of me. And I said, basically, what the heck was that? <laughs> I try not to swear, but I felt like saying something else. I would have sworn. I would have said something mean. And she said, well, you don't have the speech impediment that most people with some types of paralysis have. So I thought there was a device in your jaw that was helping you speak. And Are I thought you I could look at it. Oh my God. I would, how did you allow someone to touch you like that? Oh my God. Had I know, I mean, this happened in two minutes. It's not like she asked. Or, oh Lord, I would have been like, get out of my space. Get out of my space. <laughs> I mean, it, it just happened so quickly. I, I was, was overwhelmed. Crazy. I guess. I don't blame you and though. It's evidently late. this woman is some kind of speech pathologist. And oh really? 90% mm -hmm. of her clients had speech difficulty and some do nothing wrong with that but yeah yeah that's common. thankfully i don't it, so you get this unwanted evaluation in the middle of the what restaurant the that is nuts i would have felt very violated in that moment well i have to tell you that in the in the uh, pre-ada era mm -hmm. um our physicality our needs our level of uh, difficulty was was an object of curiosity and I do well remember being oh. assessed at one time or another really uh, and I don't even mean by medical professionals but people asking me totally personal questions like <laughs> can you have sex can you take a shower can you feed oh, yourself brush your teeth God. use the bathroom anything else you might want to ask oh man that was just you think that was a lot more common before the ADA passed oh yes 
we, we were very much a separate people. And, and um, I remember one time in a special ed class, I have almost unreadable handwriting. Mm. And one particular occupational therapist thought that that was due to a, a, some sort of lung capacity of breathing problem. <laughs> That's weird. So, so help me in the middle of English class, she got somebody to assess my breathing as I was typing. No. Oh, oh, wow. Jesus, what the hell? Like, I mean, it's <laughs> almost like a carnival <laughs> freak show or something. It, it's, don't these people think, like, wait, this person may not, listen, they may be offended. They, that doesn't even seem to cross their mind that well, someone well, with It does ability. more so now, but in those days, we were more or less considered research subjects, I hate to put it that way. Or freak shows. Yeah, yeah, it, 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 it In a way. I, I laugh at it now, but at the time it was rather invasive. I bet it was, and you were younger, which meant you probably didn't have the confidence that you have today. So it was a bit harder probably. Yes. Well, I, I was blessed with a mother and grandparents who moved heaven and earth to help me. My grandmother was a teacher, my grandfather was an artist. My mother's a psych nurse, so oh, they fought cool. like hell at a time that many did not uh, see that I got somewhere. That's good. Well, you have, gosh, you, and now you're teaching full-time as a professor, which well, is great. I'm an adjunct. In, in order to teach full-time, mm. one must convert the dissertation I wrote into a book. And with all this virus and not having the money, oh, I, I, want, no. I must go back to Africa and do some more research. But because of the disability, that's not something I want to do alone, and I don't have the funds to take someone with me right now. Ah, okay, okay, great. But well, I, I hope to do it soon because I've been an adjunct for many years, and, and it doesn't pay as well as, as full time professorship does. I don't. I well, I hope that you can go back to Africa soon before when all this is over with to do your research. That, that's my goal. But anyway, it, yeah. I, and I've been very lucky. I have a girlfriend. Um, who has another form of cerebral palsy. She's brilliant. Oh, okay. She does have a speech impediment. And unfortunately, people sometimes talk down to her and really don't recognize See? her intelligence. And that is an issue too. Like you witnessed that, you know, having the speech impediment can really make people think that your mind is also has a disability, right? Well, the and the assumption also is, since we're being frank here, yeah. the general public believes that there is some sort of blank check from the government. Mm. that we are all like the late Mr. Reeve surrounded with helpers that will do anything we want so we don't really need work because the government well, doesn't the government give you 10,000 a month and live in help and yeah. transportation and all these other wonderful That's things that they don't do. well how was it getting your job you know going in rolling into you know the job interview did you ever feel any hesitation on the people like interviewing you at all well I, I do think that um, I was lucky enough that I, I did work at a university that I got my undergrad and my master's from, so some people knew me. At least oh, in yeah. the beginning. That is nice, yep. But in other places, I mean, um, Drew is working on it, but it's not the most accessible place. I only went there because it was either that or Princeton, and who can afford oh, Princeton? Princeton, yeah, right. But, but um, <laughs> so I, I've, I've had my struggles, and, and my life, is a mm -hmm. trip to the mall compared to something. My girlfriend types yeah. with a pointer on her head. Oh, she does. Okay. And you can yeah. imagine typing a master's, a 90 page master's mm -hmm. thesis letter by letter. Wow. <laughs> she has to use her head to do it. Yes. Can she not use her voice for voice speaking? Because uh, voice... No, uh, no one can really <laughs> understand it. I can because I grew up around every conceivable impediment, and her mother can, but yeah. it's really severe. And for, she's intellectually smarter than I am and yeah yeah well so she must I, that's patience. another reason I want a full-time job because I hope to marry or something oh I hope you guys get you're gonna do that for sure what's her master's in what's she studying uh, it's a master's in uh, psychology and disability studies okay she that's did awesome. some writing about uh, Carl Jung and his uh, influence on the Oxford group that helped start Alcoholics Anonymous Oh, cool. When did that, that all started way back by him? I didn't realize that. Nice. Uh, he, he, he believed, unlike Freud, that psychology and religion could be partners. 
Oh, he and did. so he had clients with severe alcoholism, and this is in the 20s and 30s before yeah. there was rehab, as we now know it. Yeah, yeah. So he thought that a spiritual connection, which AA became, would help people, that uh, people with addictions could talk to each other and rather than be yeah. told by an expert what to do, it's a great encourage each other as, as they do even now. Well, I, my dad went through AA and it changed his life. So I do believe it's a brilliant it's idea. A, oh, mm -hmm. I know people have done it. It's a wonderful program. Mm -hmm. it's it. So smart. Go hard, go Carl. Is it J young? Hung? Young. Young. J U N N G, but pronounced young. It's a Swiss. I know my whole life. I've messed that up. I can never remember. That's so cool. He was a genius. I mean, he, he did a lot of stuff. If you, um, know anything about star wars some of the yeah. eastern spirituality with that came mm -hmm. out of his work too he are you kidding Joe me Campbell. really that's so, where the concept of the force comes from from really a thing he called racial memories holy what okay you're not racial in terms of skin color but universal yeah. humanity that there is a force guiding the universe that has good and bad sides to it Ooh, i like that's it that's where mr lucas got the idea from and that's like his religion, basically. Yes. Ooh. I wonder what happens when you die in that religion. Well, like, what happens is, mm -hmm. if you're a virtuous person, your spirit can come back and guide people. That That's in the movies, too. Like Yoda. And yes, if you are, if you're uh, evil, you are in an endless path of self-destruction. It's not quite hell, but more like every negative experience you have continues for eternity. Oh, that's pretty deep. That's cool. And, and yeah. you, funny you mentioned Yoda. I had a dear friend mm -hmm. who was my physical therapist, a man named Dr. Andrew Kramer. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was in practice for 73 years. And when he, he, wow. he grew up with a sister with paralysis, and they thought that oh. it was a mental illness, the poor girl got put in the hospital. Oh, no. He believed very much in spirituality as part of treatment. So as he would be working on my body, he would play music and pray and do a lot of other wonderful things i kind of like that i like that i'm a i'm a spiritual person i'm not very religious but i do think it helps if not well, everybody we each find mm -hmm. our, our own path i mean there has got to be something whether it is a god a, a, an energy source reincarnation right. evolution whatever something beyond what c.s lewis called our immediate sensory experience Ooh, ooh, C.S. Lewis, I like that's good. Quote, I like immediate sensory experience. Let, that's let me good. From, from distracting, was there any any other thing you wanted to add? No, I think I, we, we got this it. This has been so cool. And so before I let you go, are you currently doing your work at from home then, just out of curiosity? Yes, indeed. Uh, we, we had to do that for most of this past semester. I'm on summer break now. Okay. But we are going to um, sort of combine uh online sessions with um some face-to-face -face. some face-to-face -face this fall hopefully you can get back and in there maybe i'm hoping to also go up to canada if, if things that's a little cheaper so i can afford that right now yeah the border is gonna open there's also um propaganda programs during the cold war period and Ooh. at the same time that a lot of a lot of americans went up to canada to get out of the vietnam war draft Right. A small number of Canadians came and got involved in the anti guerrilla campaign. Right? Really? The West side. So I want to talk to a professor friend of mine, a man named Frederick Gaffin, about that. Okay, well, you need to get your butt up there. What city? Montreal, Toronto? Uh, it's actually Ottawa, the capital. Ottawa. Okay, never been there. Well, I hope you I make it. I was there years ago. It's a wonderful city. Is it beautiful? I've only heard good things. Canada. I've been. I've been to Winnipeg many a times. I'm in Minnesota myself, and I love Winnipeg. I yeah. hope you're all right out there with all the disturbances. Especially. Oh yes, we are doing just fine. The, the riots, of course, have quelled just like most across the country. There are the peaceful people that I do their Oh, 90% 90, 90 of them are, absolutely. But then you get yeah. a lunatic fringe that screws everything up. I know. It was a bit scary in Minnesota about a month ago when everybody saw, of course, what was going on after George Floyd's murder. But yeah, things in Minnesota are pretty much like everywhere, just pandemic. And there's peaceful protesters downtown. Like on the 4th of July, there was 300 people dressed in black that walked the streets peacefully. Indeed, that's, yeah. that, that, that's in the best traditions of the Republic. But uh, another part of Canada I know well is this place called Windsor. It's near Detroit. Yeah. I have family in Detroit. Okay. And 
July 1st being Canadian Independence Day, yep. Dominion Day, they call it. They yep. have joint celebrations, which I really enjoy. That would be fun. I would love to celebrate that. I was I was in Canada um, 15 years ago for the Winnipeg Folk Festival, and I got to taste it a little bit. I'm like, oh, Canada, they're pretty nice. I like it up One there. One of the things that my girlfriend Yvonne and I talk about as a honeymoon is possibly going uh, to Western Canada. So you should I, do that. Yeah. I know British Columbia. I've heard it's like going to Europe, but you're in Canada. Very beautiful, I've heard. Sorry. So Winnipeg is nice then? I've not been there it's stunning it's like it's like this beautiful town it's like a it's like a large city of us because cleveland and they have a french quarter they have all different ethnicities represented in in winnipeg they have great shopping and beautiful restaurants well, right what, the river. what i was able to do when i was there in 94 with my late grandparents and my brother uh mm -hmm. i was a liaison to the u.s and canadian scout movements Whoa, so cool. we went to see the parliament and the supreme court and and this beautiful museum of Canadian history that oh yeah I went to that I went to that one with all the dioramas in there they have a bunch of dioramas did you go to that one I also I, I volunteer for the paper mill playhouse and we teach theater to young people on the autism spectrum oh. and we are doing an Inuit play right now so. Ooh, an Inuit play you don't see many of those that sounds awesome this yes. woman actually adopted the story of Goldilocks and the three bears to have it be an Inuit young woman okay and some tribal elders in, in the form of bears and she goes into their home and they have a pulak, a, a potluck celebration oh this sounds awesome and you're gonna perform this eventually in person or uh, well, we've been doing it through the phone, but we hope to. Um, we, we, I teach with a dear friend of mine who went on my South African trip, uh, Leslie Finelli, which is called Theater for Everyone. That's and we awesome. teach theater to young people with or without disabilities to promote communication, cooperation, fun, and self-esteem. All right. You're pretty awesome, Sean. You're really doing a lot out there. I love that. Well, it's my pleasure. I feel the universe of the almighty gave me a certain amount of talents and by the grace of god i should try my best to make use of them you are so doing is this beautiful. your is this your profession or are you just I work as, I, this is this is part of my job i'm the executive director for spinalpedia which is the a nonprofit that helps people with spinal cord injuries and other forms of paralysis so we do a lot of social media but in person like adventures when the pandemic isn't happening we do these accessible adaptive adventures on the east coast and we do these podcasts every month too and you know invite people on to talk about whatever issues and i'm the host of the show but yeah well, it's all for you mean you PM. get the benefit of your genius it sounds better that way <laughs> yes it's i i did go to a psychic once many years ago and she told me this was something i should do for a living is interview people so i kind of feel you like know, I have to do it. okay then since you interview i can tell you this quote mm -hmm. you know what vice president humphrey a minnesotan himself once said about being interviewed what did he say he it is an attempt to create an ideal universe out of corporal reality. In other words, we find the best in our subjects and the people that are interviewing us, and the best part of who we both are is amalgamated to make something even better. I love that. That's why that's why people love to watch interviews, I think, because it is you get to see some good stuff for that short amount of time. People do put themselves, hopefully, their best foot forward, so to speak. Well, best as way. my as my favorite playwright, the late mm -hmm. Wendy Wasserstein said, "Our task is to rise and continue." In other words, you get in a disappointing situation, you gird your spirit and your body, and then you go back and try again and solve the problem. Or try I love again. it. Well, you know what, Sean? I would like to have you on another on the show again one day. I think you have a lot of really cool stuff to share with us, and I think it would anytime, be anytime. And as I said, Karen and another dear friend of mine are also pioneers in this field that I, I'd, I'd like to acquaintance you with because they have wonderful stories also. Please do. I can't, I, yeah, we need some, I want input on future shows. We're always looking for ideas. So I would love to meet those people and plan something for sure. Okay, so thank you again. I'm gonna let you go and- My pleasure. Now, and, could I, could I yeah. Is it, could I get a copy of this? Or? Yeah, well, definitely. What's going to happen, we're going to put this up online probably in the next few days, and then I'll send you a link on Facebook so you can have it. It'll be on iTunes, but if you want a hard copy, you absolutely bet I'll send you a hard copy too. Thank you so much, Tiffany. I really enjoyed it. 
You're very welcome. Have a wonderful day. And I'll be glad Monday. to come back anytime you like. All right. Have a good day. I'll talk to you later. You too. God bless. Okay. Bye bye. You too. God bless. All right. Hey, everybody. So we are joined by our next guest. His name is Ken McDonald, and he is from Florida. Hey, Ken, how are you? I'm doing great, Tiffany. Nice to meet you. Super good to meet you. And um, I love Florida. I know you're kind of new to the Florida area, which a lot of people end up in Florida when they're paralyzed, I feel like. It's just like it draws people to it. it if you want to, um, I know you're from Boston, right? Or from that area? Yeah, south of, south of Boston. I grew up in Massachusetts, uh, just south of Boston. Okay. Born in Boston, but lived there as a kid, but moved around a little bit. All right. Well, I've been to Boston once. I was there in 2006. I went to a wedding in Cape Cod. And uh, I, I thought it was a very large city, very overwhelming, actually. Yeah. So, okay, so now you've been in Florida. How long? I moved down here to Southwest Florida in October. Oh, what? Recently? Uh, yeah, what? yeah, I'm recent. Uh, I'm a newbie. I'm renting a house down here, and I just started a new job and uh, getting acclimated to the, uh, the culture and the different lifestyle in Massachusetts, certainly. That's so different, I bet, right? It's very, very hot, obviously. Not great quad weather. I was out for about two minutes today, literally, and said, I'm, you know, I'm not going to spend my lunch out here suffering. So You tried to, though. I tried. So that's crazy. How, is it very different than living in Boston, like, culturally? Yeah, well, you got to think about it. I mean, probably 75, 80 percent of the people I've met are transplants. Oh, cool. And I, I think that. people are really happy here. Because everybody has a story to tell. Mm -hmm. Great podcast uh, just to interview people that have transplanted. I bet. Everybody ha has their own story to tell why they re relocated, mostly from the north, obviously, yeah. uh, due to cold weather. And everyone loves the beach here in South <laughs> Florida and the palm trees. And I certainly certainly fit that, uh, that uh, you know, typical transplant. That's great. And so what area of Florida did you choose to live in? Southwest Florida, uh, Cape Coral, which is uh, next to Fort Myers, where I work. Yeah. Uh, north, uh, probably north of Na uh, Naples, where I have family. Oh, that's, cool. Your uh, family, too, in Florida. Well, that's I really, nice. Uh, moved here because my family lived close by. It's just sort of a coincidence. I was oh. researching mm -hmm. the whole Gulf Coast, actually. I was thinking initially to be in the panhandle mm -hmm. so I could explore, you know, uh, Mississippi, Alabama, oh, Louisiana. Yeah. But, That'd be uh, fun. It does get a little colder up there in the winter, so I'm below the frost area. <laughs> you never got to worry about frost, and I think that's a smart move. So, okay, I was about to mention, you know, you chose a cool spot in Florida, a very disability-oriented type of uh, spot down there. There's a lot of, just, like, I think the rugby team is, is located in the Tampa area, right? There's a Tampa Generals. I used to play against them many, many years ago when I played quad rugby. That's, yeah, uh, that's right. There might be some other teams on the East Coast of South Florida, oh, but okay. none in generally close to me. So, okay, so now how would you want this one go about, we're going to talk about the topic later, but I'm just curious. So when you found a house down there to rent, I know that you need a roll and shower because you are a C6 quad or something about that, right? Uh, you should, don't use a roll and shower. You I don't? Mean, Nice. I use a shower chair, but I do require some assistance, you know, sliding in. Okay. Uh, I did independently for decades, but with rotator cuff tears, awesome. shoulders, I'm just not quite as strong as I used to be. Okay. Uh, so I just, that's really, I need minimal assistance. But. So how did you find a house that worked for you? Just so for anyone that's kind of wanting to do the same thing one day, accessible housing can be kind of hard to find. Well, uh, you know, one advantage of living down here is all the houses are 99 percent of them are ranch style oh, so yeah. right there you're already off to a good start and i probably looked at 3,000 houses on realtor.com oh my gosh and you know i said certain criteria yeah uh, bedrooms i want definitely wanted a pool if you're yes. move down there in this hot weather you want a pool uh, a garage yeah. of course most of the houses have garages and i had to find a bathroom that where i could approach the you know the tub on the side yes and blocked by the toilet or the sink so yeah. you know my big brother says that's kind of a lot of a house for you and I said well it is but I needed you know I needed to find an accessible bathroom and, and you found it I have two bathrooms but it's funny the master bathroom I don't shower in there I shower in the guest bathroom so well and so it's a nice house it has a pool with the lift it looks like I saw yeah I bought a lift I researched pool lifts and uh 
I got an amazing deal on eBay of all yeah. places uh, from a brand new uh, portable lift. And uh, again, I need some assistance transferring on and off it. Oh, you do. Okay. And also, so I don't drown. But <laughs> but it's great. You got to have a pool. If it's gonna you're gonna live in this heat. That sounds so good. You know, going to the pool is kind of tricky as a quad. I like an inner tube. Do you just swim by yourself or do you use a floaty? Uh, I float, but I, you know, I kind of grab the side of the pool and kind of hop oh, along. I'm oh. trying not to scrape, scrape, not scrape my knees on the sandpaper-like walls. Oh, that's you know, the worst. I'm doing it with friends, so, I, you know, I get a hand. And I do have a snorkel mask. Oh, yeah. Uh, I, I can, when I snorkel, I can swim pretty confidently back and forth, but I'm, I'm still trying to get used to be in a pool again and, and be confident enough to swim. I would love a smooth bottom pool so I don't have to worry about those rough edges because those always get me too. Every yeah. time. Probably should so, get a pay. Yeah, but you could, is there, are there pools like that do have better bottoms? They have to be, right? Probably, probably, but you know, I'm pretty happy to have a pool with palm trees around. No kidding, right? And I was going to say, how about the beach that you go to? Is there a way for you to get out on the beaches? There are beaches and I do have a uh, four-wheel drive powered beach chair. Oh, you do? Nice. Um, Cajun Mobility. It's called the Cajun Commando. Oh, cool. Mine, the Blue Beast. I don't know if you've ever seen pictures of mine. I, I, I have. I have not used it here yet because of the COVID pandemic. The, the months were, it wasn't quite as hot. Uh, I just haven't got gotten my trailer registered yet. Oh, no. Trailer, and I do require assistance, so I've got to make sure someone's with me. Okay. But, but there are beaches close by where I can use it, beautiful beaches. Yeah. I love just Absolutely. going. You know, even in your power chair, if you can't get in your normal 4x4 four four chair, you can, or your manual chair, I know you push up, you can just get kind of close to the water, which feels good at some of the parks around there, right? Oh, yeah, sure. I mean, I try to get near the water, whether it's a waterfront restaurant. It is just so humid here. I mean, I don't want to be stuck out on the, on the beach, you know, on a really hot day. I know. It is bad in Minnesota, too. It's like 95 and humid every day this week. It's terrible. So, okay, now I kind of want to go back a little bit because I know you've been injured a lot longer than me. I was hurt in 93. You were hurt in the 80s, right? Oh, you're a newbie. Yeah. Right. You were injured in 1982. 1982. And you were must have young, been a young man at the time. I was 17 and junior in high school. Oh, so Five, if you do the math. So, uh, yeah, I was uh, injured in a really bad car wreck. Oh, no. Just myself, no one yeah. else to blame. Just my stupid teenage uh, uh, decisions. Yeah. Uh, decisions, uh, and yeah. Uh, it was a pretty bad crash. And I knew that I was really lucky to be alive. First of all. Did you know right away when your injury happened? Were you awake in the car? And new. I was going into shock, according to the, the, the first responders who saved my life. Mm -hmm. All I remember hearing was this calm water flow sound. And I guess I I literally drove through a brick building. And I, all that was sticking out of the building was my trunk. Whoa. My car. So that sound that I was hearing was the sprinkler system that I set off. Oh, my gosh. So I didn't know. I just had this really strange sensation that maybe I was dying or they mm. explained it to me as I was probably going into shock. Okay. Some people, are, oh, they know right away. I had an idea when I got hurt, but so now when you went to the rehab and went to the hospital, I guess, and they told you, okay, Ken, you're paralyzed. What were you thinking? Were you just happy to be alive or were you like, oh my God, this is going to suck? Uh, yeah, those early days. I mean, my family, I was transported to one hospital for a couple of days mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, my family, I'm the youngest of nine, so I have a great wow. support system. I remember my, uh, my pregnant sister, she, was, she gave birth to her first son like three days after my injury. Oh, wow. And she was really upset, and I said, listen, I know you're upset, but it could be a lot worse, so I'm here. Yeah. You know, I mean, I realized that I'd made a terrible mistake. Yeah. I was pretty angry at myself. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, I knew that I was, uh, I was screwed basically yeah. but it's a frustrating oh, feeling yeah we all get that and how did you manage to get past that and you know start living life again well I remember being kind of forced to talk to a psychologist see I was in a, a, designa a designated uh, New England Regional Spinal Cord Injury Center so I had 24 beds devoted mm -hmm. to spinal cord injuries okay so obviously there was a lot of peer support I mean I, I'm, I'm really fortunate to have excellent rehab in Boston, you know, Boston is some of the best hospitals oh, yeah. in the world. Spalding, right? Spalding's located there. I, I, I initially resisted 
discussing it with the with the psychologist. And I always describe him. I won't use his name, but he, he kind of looked like Richard Dreyfus in Jaws. You know, the guy with the beard, the glasses. Oh yeah, I love he that character. Sit there and stare at me in my room, and I said, "Look, dude, I have nothing to say. Oh no, this is in prison. I don't want to talk about it." But he wouldn't. He was persistent, and actually, and eventually, I just opened up and and you know expressed my feelings about it. And uh, yeah. did he help? Help. Yeah, of course it helped. And then obviously the peer support. Of That's other guys. huge. Mm-hmm. And another story I think I relate to in, in my story that I wrote. Yeah. Uh, you know, you, you and when you have this kind of injury happen, you, you, you learn to put things in perspective. Yeah. And at night we would, you know, the guys or all, all the, the patients would get together, we'd play poker. Yeah. There was a guy, uh, and I remember he was probably like a C4 quad. He couldn't move below his shoulders. Okay. I was helping him with his cards, helping feed him chips and you know Doritos <laughs> and this guy said to me one day you know he had a newborn baby and said Ken this, this this sucks I can't even hold my my new baby oh my god you know that there's there's a there's a rude awakening right there yeah know? right stop being sad about your situation mm-hmm. it's not like I wasn't I mean I was pretty devastated I tell yeah you, that that first year I probably literally cried myself to sleep I was so angry with myself because I was an athlete I was you know uh popular in school, uh, just, you know, I had everything going for me, a good student, I had plans mm-hmm. to go to college. Yeah, I kind yeah. of felt like I, I just really ruined all of that. I, and that's the common, I mean, I sure felt the same in many ways, not, I wasn't popular like you when I got hurt, but uh, yeah, but I did feel that way. You feel guilty, don't you? You feel so guilty with your family too. Yeah, I feel like mm-hmm. I let a lot of people down and, yeah. uh, but I also, I think when I was in rehab, I was filmed on some Boston evening TV show and the doctor came in and I remember saying, somewhere there's a videotape that I don't want to see. But <laughs> I, I told him, you know, I'm only 17. I have my whole life ahead of me. Yeah. So yeah. Kinda, you know, I just, you have to be self-motivated. And I see you a do. lot of people, newly injured folks struggle with that, but you really, you know, it's you, difficult. you can grieve the loss, but at some point you need to move on and, and really... And, you know, you got to get past it. Looking, do. looking to the past is, is not going to help you uh, achieve your goals. No, you got to live in the moment, right? That's what they always say. Live in the moment. Live in the moment. At least that's my philosophy. You know, that's how, that's how I dealt with it for 38 years and counting. You know, well, you were so young. I was 14, too. And, you know, you're all of a sudden you're paralyzed. You're living life in a wheelchair. And people start treating you differently, of course, which I kind of had a hard time dealing with. I got kind of frustrated. What was it like for you kind of going back out in the world as a young man in a wheelchair and were people assuming stupid things about you or what kind of things did you run into? I remember the first time I went to the big mall near me. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm not sure if I drove by then, if I was driving. Mm-hmm. Maybe not. Maybe someone dropped me off. I was so paranoid. I felt everybody in the mall was staring at me. Yeah. Maybe some of them were, but I was so <laughs> freaked out by it. I know. Yeah. And, uh, it just took a, a long time for me to get used to being in the chair. I remember my first day back in high school, yeah. my senior year, and uh, there were teachers, there were staff and students that hadn't seen me. Okay. You know, Ken, it was Ken, the, the big you know athlete, the jock and all that. Right, I was right. Wheeling into class the first day, I was oh, no. terrified. I was oh, terrified. No. What were, um, did anyone, did people approach you the right way and say the right thing? Or what did, did people just not knowing what to say did, well, how did that go a little both you know you could see the uh the uncomfortableness uh, yeah. and i don't blame them yeah, I they feel bad. The way, if i had a friend or a classmate that yeah. had seen uh in a wheelchair and suddenly i know your feet comes rolling in so yeah i can i can understand so how did it go though you know with the topic of this podcast is people thinking we're not capable of what we really are you know i know when i been out and about people think you know, oh, what does she want for dinner? Or will they ask, they don't want to direct questions towards you sometimes. They don't think that you're, you know, you're all there mentally. Have you ever run into that at all? Oh, of course. I mean, all the time, even <laughs> recently as a few months ago. I mean, like, two things. Fortunately, I'm, I'm an extrovert and also I'm pretty assertive. Mm-hmm. And the one thing that drives me crazy, you go to a restaurant with a friend, someone in, in the host or hostess looks at them instead of you in the eye and said, where would he like to sit? This happens, yeah. Oh, and, and that, that one gets me. 
<laughs> I'm pretty thick skin, but that one gets me and I'll say, I'm right here. You can ask me. That's good. That's what I, I like do to too. I like to sit over there. And sometimes they're just, people are so uncomfortable. They just, they can't look you in the eye. And they cannot look you in the eye. That happens all the time to me. They can't look you in the eye. It kind of bugs you, doesn't it? It's like, just look at me in the face. It does. I mean, again, I'm, I've been doing this a long time, so I'm, I'm used to all types of reactions from people. So many people just don't know, who don't know anybody in a wheelchair, right? So they have right. all these ideas. And, you know, you just have to, it does help to be assertive. And if you're assertive and you show people that you're confident in who you are, they tend to look past the wheels and see you, see the yeah. person first. But it does take some work. Yeah. How about when you started, you know, uh, interviewing for jobs as a, you know, someone who used to, has a disability, was it pretty, did you run into any discrimination or people not thinking you're capable at all? No, not so much in interviewing jobs. I That's mostly good. work in the disability community. Mm -hmm. is I think the discrimination is probably more in the application process. Oh, yeah. Now that I'm a little older and uh, might be some age discrimination or a lot of my I have a really nice resume, but a lot of it's disability focused. I try oh, to yeah. sort of, you know, tailor the resume when I'm looking for a job. Yeah. But, you know, you can only, I mean, yeah, I mean, I worked in medical equipment, DME. I worked oh, in, uh, cool. you know, uh, the independent living movement. I, I ran my own yeah. wheelchair van rental business. This is I your was, life, right? <laughs> I ran, you know, I, ran, I was a operations manager of a custom wheelchair company. So, I mean, it's kind of hard to to hide that it is and it sucks that you kind of feel like you need to though at the same time like well it's too disability it's too disability like this might turn people off or something is that what you're worried about yeah i mean this, again and also being 55 there's definitely age discrimination i mean the job that i i just took yeah i, I reached I, I looked uh i contacted them and, and uh, it's an independent living center right near me right it's I know. Good. so i feel like i've come full circle because my first job out of college was at the Boston Center for Independent Living Center, which was the second IL center in the country. It so was. now here I am, uh, that was 1988. Cool. So here I am like 30, whatever, I don't know, 32 years later, working for an IL center with all that additional experience, so. That's amazing. What are you That's doing for them? Job. What's that? What's your job title at your new position? Let me see, they kind of customize it. I am an independent living and access coordinator. Okay. So I've done a lot of ADA work, consulting, so they've kind of combined that. with. So I'm going to be um, representing the uh, the Independent Living Center for, on different county boards and, and transportation boards. Ooh. Now, systemic, how they you know, system, systemic ADA issues, along with the individual advocacy for, for consumers. So the Independent Living Center there is, is involved in making sure that the right laws get passed and they advocate for it, essentially, is what you'd be uh, doing. Yeah, ADA compliance and, and other laws, okay. you know, housing laws. Okay. Uh, all the applicable laws. I'm still learning some of the different laws in Florida. Oh, in, I bet it's in different. Massachusetts, different programs. Yep. Whether it's attendant care or transportation programs in the area, I'm still learning. It's still, there's a lot to learn in Florida. I think for a lot yeah. of people, I, I wanted to move there, but I don't think they have a lot of caregivers through their Medicaid program, right, down there? They actually do. There is a great program that I didn't know about. It's, really? Uh, it's for it's a work incentive program for disabled adults that are going back to work, and the state is actually very underutilized. What's it called? It's called JP Pass, I believe. If anyone's looking. Oh, awesome! So, Ken. Yeah. yeah, my employer actually referred me to that, but I'm kind of in like a catch twenty two because I'm still on SSDI. I'm in the trial work period okay. and I'm employed, so you cannot be on the program if you're on SSDI, even though it's a work incentive program. Oh, that's weird. So we're trying to see if there's some sort of waiver on that. That's awesome. But there are, you know, those are things I need to learn. There's a free, uh, uh, like a toll exempt program that I'm applying for. So okay. I don't have to pay tolls when I drive to work. No way. They have that if you have a spouse right, injury? Right, exactly. Like in Massachusetts, we didn't have to pay parking meters here. Right. Here, same way. Same in Minneapolis. I can park anywhere for up to four hours free. Right, right. A lot of that's because of our dexterity issues with quads, you know, trying to manipulated yeah. parking meter or whatnot. It's the same with the toll. I, yeah. I got trapped, I thought I was trapped in a garage, parking garage a couple weeks ago. No there was way. There a live attendant there and I couldn't, I couldn't get my credit card, my debit card out of the little slot. I had to push yes. the button. Yes, I, I can't do that. Virtual, some virtual attendant, there was no live person there. So that might be something I need to advocate 
you know, advocate about with my, uh, with my job. Because yeah. there's, you know, I'm, I'm not trying to get free parking in the garage. I just, I can't, you know, I don't have the dexterity. That's, that's the same reason behind the tolls, right? Yep, or, exactly. Or, or the, the, the parking meter. So mm-hmm. I'm going to have to do some advocacy around that because that was really frustrating. You know? That's scary. That um, I once knew a quad who, who uh, figured out that problem by keeping a reacher stick with, with gum at the end of the reacher stick, and then he would take it and grab the ticket and pull things out. Yeah, it should be a better way. I mean, I, I should, be able, should have been able to pay before I got to the gate. Agreed. You know, and in the garage. Well. You know, a lot of places will have that, but, you know. It's kind of, it was pretty stressful because I'm at the gate and I'm trying to get the gate open. Fortunately, nobody was behind me. I may have probably asked them to help me if, if there was someone behind me. But and the worst, <laughs> worst comes the worst. You could always call 911, right? Yeah, well, I, I pushed the buzzer, and but I was kind of freaked out for a few minutes there. Gee, Louise, that's my worst nightmare. I drive too, and I cannot do the parking meters. I always street parking constantly. It gets old after a while, though, doesn't it? Mm. Yeah, it's stressful. It's one of the things we deal with, though, you know? It is. People understand. It is. They think, you know, oh, well, it sucks that you can't walk. I said, well, that's, that's one aspect of it. There's so many other daily oh, yeah, aspects no of life that people don't understand. It's not so much the lack of walking. It's just all the other little things. It's every little thing that comes with it. And, uh, yeah, you only know it when you meet someone and you hang out with someone for a while in a wheelchair. It's the only way. Man, so, okay, before I let you go, your succulent garden down in Florida, that is a beautiful thing you have down there. And is that just a new thing you discovered living in Florida, gardening, or is that something well, you always enjoyed? No, I actually, I graduated from uh, an agricultural high school, Norfolk County Agricultural High School, Ooh. second oldest agricultural high school in the country, I believe. Oh, no way. I was a landscape major, so I was oh, going to be a landscape architect. Oh, you were going to do that. Okay. When you're well, going to be a plant science major in college, you better pass all your science courses. So I wasn't very good in chemistry and failed chemistry. So <laughs> oh, no. my major. So no, I've always loved gardening. Oh, that and, sounds so uh, good. In a, in a chair, you know, I've, got, I've probably got about 40 plants. And uh, cool. you know, I, I love, uh, it's just nice. It's just a nice hobby to have. And It's and, therapy. Uh, I feel like it's really good when you're paralyzed to be around plants or something about it. You should have seen me transplant two uh, cactus yesterday without gloves. That was pretty. No way! Weird. You got your quad hands in there and did, did it. Yeah, only got stabbed <laughs> twice and no, no real damage. Well, congratulations! I don't think I could do that. I'm, I'm, I, I don't know. After being paralyzed, I get so I can't get my hands dirty. I'm a baby. I get all, and I don't know. I need to learn to get them dirty again. I, I'm a baby about that. Well, I don't mind getting them dirty, but I do mind. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of spiders in Florida. Oh. So I'm a little more cautious about digging my hands into the. Really? So a few spiders popped out. A lizard popped out once. I didn't mind the lizard. No way. The spiders are in the spider bite in Massachusetts. Got get really infected on my arm. Ooh. So I'm a little arachnophobic. So that's Ooh. one part I do have tend to have large spiders in my house that I'm, often like to surprise me in the bedroom. And oh no, don't say that. That's the, okay. Well, that's that's the one trade off, I guess, for the good weather. You have to be okay with the big spiders. Well, correct. Because they don't die. It gets so cold. It never gets cold down there, so they just keep getting bigger. Well, I do have lizards all on my lanai around the pool, and I noticed they're having babies because I've seen some little baby lizards. Oh, no. Apparently, they, like, lay one egg at a time. I looked online, and uh, so I've got little babies out there. So I like lizards. So they're going to take care of any spiders out there. They will. That's cool. Well, okay. You are so fun, you know, living down there in Florida and just having this new life experience down there. You're inspiring me. I told you online too, I would love to do that myself one day, being in Minnesota my whole life. So I may meet you down there at some point. You can come visit. I have a guest bedroom. Okay. I may take you up. (laughs) Sorry. (laughs) I love that part of Florida. My mom stays in the Sanibel Island area. I love it there. That's one of my favorite beaches I go to. And it's not very accessible though, but there was a manual chair that I rented that we pushed out. So the uh, anyway. Causeway beaches are accessible along the Causeway. I oh, found yeah. some great spots with some trees, so with some shade. Okay, I know I need to go back. It's been since two thousand six. So, anyways, but thank you for sharing, Ken. It's been really great to talk with you, and have a great rest of the summer. And maybe we'll have you back on at some point. We'll talk more about life in Florida. All right, Tiffany. Great to talk with you. All right. See you later. Bye. Bye. Hey, everybody. So we are joined by our final guest for this month's show. Her name is Antonia Sinibaldi. She is from New Jersey, I believe, right? So hey, Antonia, how's it going? It's going 
going well. I'm surviving Corona. Hey. I'm surviving, surviving this madness. Congratulations on that. It's been a long four months, hasn't it? It blends in. Like the house, like being at home every day is the same. It just, it just blends in. Every it day is a blur. So where in New Jersey are you? Are you near the New York area or you're more yeah. in the southern, you're in the New York area? Okay. Um, uh, yeah, I'm, de I'm very, very North Jersey. I'm, okay. I'm not North, I'm not North, like, close to Pennsylvania area. I'm mm -hmm. North, like, I, I have New York City in my backyard, so I can see from my window. That's so cool. Okay. Yeah. So I know a little bit about how you were injured, but people who are watching probably don't. So if you don't mind, let's kind of go back to 1999. I know yes, that's when you were injured. How old were you at the time of your injury? Yeah, I was in a car accident with my mom, my dad, and I. And I I got a C2, uh, C2, 3, 4, yeah. and 5, possibly 6 and 7. Incomplete injury. Wow. My dad was the one who, um, who, um, at the time, yeah. was the head medical. Like my mom and I were both injured, but he had to go through every, he had to go through everything. So he was mm -hmm. like, oh, okay. So like the, I was two, yeah. And so yeah. So, but so you. <laughs> <laughs> that must have been really hard for your whole family to have to go through that. Do you remember much at your age when that happened? I remember. I uh, no, no. I remember. I I was two. You were I two. remember me at the rehab. I don't necessarily remember before. I remember walking in my house, looking in right before we went in a car, and I mm. remember that I was vomiting. Probably before the accident, and then we uh, got into the accident. Um, but I remember my my memory is clearer, like yeah. after we had and after. Okay, yeah, I mean, yeah, you were so little. I don't think I've ever interviewed someone so young before having an injury at your age. So for you, I mean, how have I until recently? Yeah, <laughs> oh, really? You just, you, did you just meet someone who, who was also injured young? Yeah, a little boy. California, oh, he's really? C2 all the way to T4, oh, and really? so like he's the cutest little thing. But I, I um, it was just um more emotional for me to meet him than yeah. him to meet me. He can care less about me, but I care more about him. Yeah. <laughs> That's how it is. Kids are like that. I know. Oh, so you know, I feel like you know. Do you, could you share just a little bit about what it was like being a kid in a with your situation? I mean. You probably don't have a lot to compare it to because that's your normal, but what was it like? Did you, were you self-conscious a lot about your chair or did you try to go through your childhood just not caring too much about your injury or how did it go? I was more concerned about functioning as fast, okay. functioning as fast. So like, I don't, um, I, uh, I, <laughs> And like spasming in public or spasming with in front of my class or or mm -hmm. suctioning and having long suction. Oh like yeah. Like that is what bothers me most. Driving my chair is it's it's it's, it's more it's, it's my car. That's my baby. Yeah. So I'm not I'm not that because of that. And there's there's like more there are more people who drive chairs than need suction. So, yeah. so like, so I, such an is fascinating, two things that I always hated doing in public, but I've gotten better. You got used to it. And I think that's it. important to mention. A lot of people don't realize that that's a whole other world of being paralyzed. It's not just not being able to walk. There is a whole other, bunch of other stuff happening, like yeah. the suctioning thing, you know, and the spasm. Yeah, the, doctor, the doctors don't even realize that either. No, they don't. That's don't. So with the suctioning, I know that can ha that happens because you're on a ventilator, right? And so going through, did you go to normal school and all that kind of thing, or were you? Um, I did. I, I did. I, I, yeah, I went to normal school. I started in a special ed pre-K, and I remember we had two, three kids that couldn't walk. Okay. And now as we're older, they can walk with like a, a crutches, or they can walk with like. Uh, like some something they have to balance on, but right, um, right. but they stayed in special 
and in a regular school system. Like they only very few were transferred to like a special school, but then that some, but then I also used to go to a special ed camp, a special ed, uh, special ed camp for mm -hmm. kids in chairs, but I was the only one that, um, I was the only one at the time that was very normal, like that, very like cognitive. Like I would finish my work faster than everybody. I would talk about politics. I would talk to every teacher. I was the one who was the most social, and I still am. But now they're mm -hmm. all normal. They all either went to college or they um or they um can talk on any topic. But I was the one who was never socially isolated. That's yeah. good. That's good. Well, you are, you, how old are you, right? You're like 20. I'm 23. You're 23. Yeah. You're very young. And, you know, you, you were lucky, I mean, to be alive, right? You know, growing up during a lot of, you know, laws were passed before that your injury happened to make sure that we do have equal rights in school and all that. But you do run across, you know, kids that aren't really sure about if they want to play with you or invite you to their birthday parties. Like, did you have this Plenty of friends and all that growing up. Was that all normal that for you? That happened more at the age. Okay. That happened more at the age. Like the older I get, the less and less. The less. The less. In fight. But, um, yeah. but then, um, like, uh, less is more, I guess. And I tell myself the same thing. Like, like growing up, I went to everybody's birthday party in Cliffside Park. And in the town that I used to live before the town that I live in now, but the town that I grew up in at first, there's more people with paralysis there. Uh -huh. And then in the town that I grew up with, so like, so like, um, it's like, it's, it, um, it, it was easier in the town before. Okay. The town I live in then, yeah. Oh, that's too bad. I know it's much easier when there's more people who are disabled in the community and the people are used to seeing, you know, people like you out and about, right? Yeah. So, so what was it like? You graduated from high school on time, right? And everything was normal? Or I graduated from high school and I'm happy. So happy that yeah. I graduated from high school. I still, I can't believe it's been five years. Um, <laughs> I'm so happy. But, so uh, yeah, so you got out of that high school. I, I did you were you happy to leave high school or did you have a badly, pretty, badly, 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 badly. Me too. Badly. So badly. Okay. and then you went to which college after? I, right. So I had a year off for a number of reasons, and then I um I had a year off for a number of reasons, and mm -hmm. then I. Decided I want to try and go back to college. So I just, so I was like, instead of doing a big list, just do one at a time. So I applied to Marymount, Marymount Manhattan College, and I've been studying there for four years. Oh, both so cool. physically, physically and online. Physical and online, and you are currently still a student there, right? Yeah, I'm just doing online. Right online. Now through yep. Yeah. Yep. And what's, what year are you there? I'm somewhere, I, I'm part-time, so I'm somewhere between junior, senior. Yeah. Close. That's, good. Yeah. that's good. You're, you know, so I think it's so cool. So I love that you sing. I think it is so cool. And you wrote a blog for Spinalpedia about singing with a ventilator and all that. And I, could you talk a little bit about how you got into singing and how that became? Yeah, so... Yeah. So, both my family, well, my mom basically, and her family, but my parents, they didn't want to raise me with a disability. They didn't want me to be like in a special group of people with disability, yeah. uh, only to like X amount of time. So, like, my dad at the time, mm -hmm. um, he, um, he loves classic, classic movie, classic mm -hmm. books. He mm. loves the classic. Yeah. And so yeah. he would play the sound of music. And I would sing the sound of music. And then my grandmother would sing religious prayers in like right. a melody. And then and then as 
I train myself with the melody, I would feel the vibration in my hands and and I feel the vibration in my body and I, I'm not, not enough to make me fathom just to feel complete. So mm -hmm. I'm like, I can sing. I can sing with this, with this <laughs> machine. I can I do it certain ways. But yes, yeah, so I was fine. You were five. Well, singing brings everybody joy. Who I love to sing, even by myself. I don't know. If I'm so, what was it like to? Did you take lessons and stuff and all that as a vet user? Yeah, I've cool. taken. I've I've taken. Uh, I've been taking voice lessons for almost all my life. But <laughs> I um, as I get older, I want more um more proper, more formal training. Right. Like, I don't want to just sing a guitar and, and do karaoke. Like I wanted to, I wanted to clean it up. I wanted to, to um, make, it, make it proper. I wanted to like strengthen it as much as possible. So when I was in my teens, like around 15 and 16, mm -hmm. my breathing would change, but not, not the way it is now, but it was um it was more like i had to change the way my settings were in order to sing my song because right. when i was uh, so let's see this was like 16 i 15 16 i started knowing that my throat the not the trachea mm -hmm. the size of the throat the larynx where the vocal cords are I keep on mm -hmm. feeling like someone is pulling unless I sing in my standard, like I like I'm in now. Mm -hmm. uh, um, I need to change my settings, and then my voice teacher was like, "I guess as you age, your diaphragm is in one one. The nerves are getting weaker, but at the same time, they're getting stronger." And then my doctor, so I guess the, my doc, my surgeon is like, "Actually, now the nerves are getting stronger, and the bones are getting." And they had spinal stenosis and blah blah blah. But um, oh my God. I had to change the vent in order to sing. So wow. Yeah. So what was the vent that you switched to for people who are no, interested? No, no, no. It wasn't the vent I oh. switched. It was how I used the vent. So at the time, <laughs> okay. Yeah. So at the time, I just used oxygen to increase my settings, and then I would increase the press the vital tidal volume, but I need more air. And oh. then depending on the song, I would remove more of the, the um, pressure support so I can do more work and then raise the pressure support so I can cool. ha have the support that I need. And so it's still, and that's my, it, it's, I love it. I love <laughs> it. And I'm very grateful that I figured it out what to do because none of the doctors know what to do. They can experiment on you because they're where, where they're guinea pig, but yeah. <laughs> did you ever run across any doctors that didn't want you to play around with your ventilator to to to, to sing? Maybe? Mm -hmm. No. No, no 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 no. What well, well I don't I don't know. I have to I have to think about it. My pediatric pulmonologist was more Vent literate mm -hmm. than the one I have now. She yeah. she still vent literate, but she wasn't as vent literate as the other pulmonologists. Mm -hmm. Oh, she doesn't care what she is that, but uh, but mm -hmm. um, she they're both very good in different ways. But the one from my my pediatric one was like, and the more the bigger you sing, the bigger the nose. More yeah. the lungs are working, so eventually the pacemaker will be better for you. Not now, you're too young, you're too severe. But, um, and then I had it when I was 21, and it worked. It helped my singing in many ways, cool. but um, that's another story for another day. Well, that's great. I love that you sing. I, I'm not going to ask you to sing right now for us, but if people want to see you sing, do you have any videos online available? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I have a, a YouTube channel. I started off doing cover songs when I was 14 and then I pro progressed to doing vlogs of my life because singing is not going to change society as much as I want and 
the activist and a politician in me uh, mm -hmm. wants to do more. So I started teaching about Ben videos and Oh, like uh, cool. On your YouTube channel? All right. You're doing everything yeah. on there. All right. Well, and then I'm we'll... on Instagram. I'm on Facebook. I, um, Instagram is e it, not all apps, not all, not every social media platform is easy to use at the same time. So for me, I, I need to, uh, cause I have no hand movement. So like, so I, um, I yeah I will try to be as responsive as possible. But I prefer Instagram. Like I prefer Instagram and Twitter to chat, and then Facebook and YouTube to like post stuff. But I try to be as helpful as possible. Okay. Well, we will share links to all of your social media stuff um, when this podcast. I have a website that I yep. put my spinal media stuff on. As okay. Well, so. Yeah, Antonia. It's AntoniaCinibaldi dot com, right? Okay. okay, we'll post that up there on the page when we get this up. So do you have any funny or crazy stories to share about people just not really understanding you, uh, your disability and thinking like, you know, you might have a mental disability because that's kind of the topic of the podcast we're doing? I have a lot. Um, well, I can talk in two things. I yeah. like when people are here. Not every person, but like when not the most educated person, I should say, or the aware, self-aware, I should say, mm -hmm. um, they think C2 and C3 makes a com complete brain injury. And no, 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 I know they're so close to the brain, but it doesn't affect your cognition. Like I have family members, that are not close to you, who live up across the country, and they may come over for, for like family deaths or something, and they're like, oh wow, you're so witty. And I'm like, oh, I have, oh, you don't know how much wit I have. Right oh, here. no. <laughs> yeah. And I get sassy. And then, like, and then they're like, oh, and then, um, and then they, um, someone's like, wow, you're so alert. So they think, see, two, three, and four. And everything on the upper cervical end is so brain injury. That's and my brain doctor brain. did say that it's ninety, like eight, nine percent possible that the halo that I had did give me brain injury, but not enough to affect cognition, affect yeah. plasticity. Yeah. Wow. That's crazy. I've never heard of anyone assuming a brain injury a company is a C2 or a C3 injury. I haven't heard that one. That's a silly so, one. Oh. Yeah. And then uh, when I went to college, when I went to college, mm -hmm. at the time, I was so pissed, if I can say that word, pissed. Oh, can you, can I, say, yeah, you can say pissed. Absolutely. I was, I was so pissed pissed off that I was like, I was kind of offended, but then at the same time, when I, thanks to Spinopedia, and yeah. thanks to reading books more than watching TV, the movies, and studying, teaching myself what, uh, teaching myself, I, I, it's more like unaware, so my classmate was, Oh, it's in Oregon, mm -hmm. and we went to the same college. I don't know where she is now, if we graduated or not. But we had two class, two classes freshman year, and the second class that year in the spring semester, she was like, "I didn't have TV growing up. I didn't have TV growing up. I didn't have TV growing up. But now I'm living in the dorms, and I appreciate it." So being paralyzed all my life, I was like, "What the? What do you do? If you yeah. don't have TV." <laughs> He's like, "Dad, no offense, that's the dumbest question, but I play with trees and I jump around and I play with grass and I and I I should have said something, but I didn't want to. I didn't want to make a big thing out of it. But like, when you grow up, full fully." Quad, not partial quad, if I can say that. Cause it depends, yeah. on, depends on a person. People are so touchy. Oh, I fully, know. When you're fully quad and you yeah. have no hand movement, mm -hmm. 
movement and you barely have finger movement and you're on a friggin' bent. Like TV, TV and the internet is the only thing I ever had. So like you can't tell a person in a yeah. uh, who's wow, that you're dumb for mm. not having, for not mm. knowing what it's like to jump on a tree or That's jump silly. in that. And okay. like, and that okay. is, is what it's me up. Oh, that's very yeah. insensitive. People can be so. Oof, that's mean, though. Yeah. yeah. But I don't think she meant it that way. I think she didn't realize how much your body need does when you jump on trees and jumping down and all that stuff. So yeah. Well, you know, she doesn't realize if you're not going to be doing those things growing up, you're not going to understand, you're not going to think about yeah. that. Yeah, she, she, that's like, to, my I, I would have, yeah. My best friend, I, he tell, he made a, he made an amazing quote throughout the year that I never fully understood, I, I understood it. In, in, in what he was saying, but I never, like, fully, I never got the literary sense of it. So, his saying is, you're trapped in a glass cage of emotion. And I'm like, oh, yeah, my head is trapped in an emotion. My body is trapped in an emotion. But then now, with this corona, and I haven't physically seen him oh. and since, the, since the madness started. Mm. I was like, oh, wow, he's just, he Sorry, I'm trapped in a body of emotion, and my body is my cage. So Aww. yeah, so I, so he, that's like he's my best friend. But I just wish more and more people, especially young people, would understand. Older people get it because I have older people yell at my aunts and my, 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 the family members, and they're like, she can't do anything. But like young people my age, they're, they're idiots. So oh. <sighs> it sucks that the young people are not being educated in school about just disabilities more and what's not so it's not crazy, you know, for someone in a wheelchair to go out and have a life. I don't it's frustrating, isn't it, to have to always educate people. Well I have a life. I just don't know the physical part of a life. Life. Mm -hmm. Like I know that grass is wet when it's moist because when I was younger, my nurse used to, my nurse and my aide would put me on the grass to um, play with the other kids and I would feel the grass and I would love that moistness. And then my my family, my mom's family grew up on a farm. So they tried to make me feel the dirt as much as possible. So they would pick up the dirt and put it in my hands and my dad would like have snowball fights on the porch so I could Aww. feel the snow like like <laughs> they did a really good job. That's the best. Yeah. So do you ever get out of your wheelchair now and get on the grass? Depends. I on think who I'm with. Yeah. Uh, I, 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 uh, depends on who I'm with. Right. Uh, who I'm with. Like, if that person is strong enough to pick me up and hold a vent. Totally. And, oh, yeah. somebody's going to have to, I mean, the vent come with a backpack, so they can put the back. They can, um, I don't know, I can't speak for every vet, but like the LTVs come with a backpack, so like, um, they can put on their back. So like if I, if, um, I get a boyfriend and he's strong enough, he can like hold the, the vent on and, and me as a backpack, but it all depends on the person. I love and that. As well. I like the idea of a boyfriend carrying you with your ventilator pack. That sounds pretty yes. awesome. <laughs> so, have you had, have you dated anyone since your injury? No, I haven't. Okay. Well, I know that there's someone out there for you. And I know that. I know. I've, I've, I know there's plenty of people on events that have gotten married. So, I hope really? that you, oh, yeah. <laughs> Oh, that oh yeah, I know um, a girl up in Canada. Her, she's on a vent and she's got married and she's a kindergarten teacher actually. And she brings a PCA with her to class every day. Her name. She gets Dwayne. a what? Uh, she she gets a what? A PCA, a caregiver. She goes to work every day with a caregiver. Nice, she's nice, a kindergarten. Nice. She's so a kindergarten like, what teacher. Part of we're in Canada. I think all the I, I don't know exactly. It's been a while. She, maybe she's in Toronto. Oh, what's her name? I don't know. 
Joanna. I forget her last name, but she's friends with me on Facebook, so I can get her information. Okay. To you. Yeah, there's like, I guess not a ton, but I know people that have, whether they're on vents or they have no arm movement, there are people out there in really cool relationships. You yeah. Know? Yeah, it's totally possible. I know it's, as always, when I was 23, I was in this really bad relationship, but. Are you married? Or? I know, I'm 40, and I have a boyfriend of over, like, almost two years, but yeah, I haven't been married yet, but maybe one day. I have to always. Do you have kids? So you don't have kids? No kids either. I'm one of those, just the working ladies. I was hurt when I was 14. And I, you know, I wasn't against the idea of having kids in my life, but it just never happened. You know, you need the right person, and I never met the right guy, and now I'm 40, so I don't know if it's going to happen for me, but it's okay. Oh, like, always, well, if, you, if, if this guy is the one, um, then you guys can adopt kids since we, we it's could. late, but I... I'm all for adoption. Me too, actually. The older I get, I'm like, I'm going to adopt. There's a lot of kids out there that you hear these I horror need stories. They need they to help. Their parents don't want them. You hear these terrible stories about people uh, literally abandoning their children. And I'm like, sign That's me scary. up. It is scary. And I'm like, I'll take care of that kid. Me, I, I mean, I, I, I hear, I heard, there's just sad stories about people that are just don't want to be parents. Yeah. And I feel like that would be a situation where I would like to kind of roll on in there and adopt a kid one day. Even when I'm 45, you know, I'm 40, so I feel like I got a little bit of time. I don't know. It's a big decision as a wheelchair user to do that because I feel like I'm overwhelmed with just taking care of myself every day, you know? I know. Well, you're right. I just, um, you have way more movement than most people or some people, so yeah. you, can use that. you can use that to an advantage. I know. I just hate my hands so much, and I feel like if I couldn't, like, you know, do the, like, give them things and here's your like do you want to braid your hair i can't braid her hair i can't what her. side do you have more movement on um my right but i have actually no hand movement and it's frustrating even for me when i do makeup no, i know i just i see you moving you left yeah. arm a lot so I'm oh, like, yeah. right i just right-handed but i can move both arms pretty good yeah i can it's okay. just the hands it's the hands that drive me crazy they are the worst and i feel like it's just up to, you know, I know some people that have kids and they don't even move their arms at all and they don't care, but it's up to... No, I know what, I, mm -hmm. I can't move my hand, my wrist either, I, yeah. but I, um, yeah. I can't move my wrist either, but, um, I can feel my wrist. Can you right? see your fingers? I can feel a little, but I just don't have the patience, you know. Some people can't move anything and they have children and they don't care, but I would... Yeah, like, I know. They I, have a lot of patience. I, I gained patience as I got older. You, you did, yeah. I call them my best friend. I, I think call them my mom and religion. And my best friend really made That's great. I bet you were more patient than I am. I, I, we all have our moments. I am. Yeah, I bet you are. I am. So, what do you have any advice on how you know to deal to be more patient before I let you go? Since we are kind of running low on time here. Right. I um to get more patience, you need to. It's hard, isn't it? It's easier to think mm -hmm. than words. Mm -hmm. It um to get patient, you need to think about the word times in your life and see how you manage to it. Cause I being raised with this damn thing, I um I thought I was gonna be dead at seven because of my pain and the spasticity, but and I had, I met my neurosurgeon when I was nine, and oh, I was like, oh, I'm not going to live till 10. And then when I was 10, I was like, I'm not going to live till 16. And then when oh, I was 16, I'm not going to live till 18. And 18, I, I, 18 and 19, I wrote my book. And then I, and then I started writing uh, uh, for you guys. And um, mm. then 23, yeah, and I'm like, oh, wow, I lived all this crap, all this crap I lived. God helped me in so many ways. So uh, that's how I got, I got patient. I'm like, okay, I lived through it before and I can live you through did. it again. Yeah, that's that's really cool. Just kind of reminding yourself where you've been. And that's that does help. It does. That's awesome. Well, where can people uh, buy your... Sorry, go ahead. I was going to ask, can I share this? This yeah. pocket when it's done? Absolutely, you can share it with anybody. Yeah. Good. I want to put it on my website and whatever mm -hmm. the uh, social media I have. 
Oh yeah, share it everywhere. Now, before I let you go, where can people buy your book and that kind of thing? Is it on your website? My book is on Amazon. It was supposed to be on Audible, but Corona slowed everything down. So oh, no. I will ask them to just upload it now to Audible. Um, okay. And I and then it will be on Audible. But it's definitely on Amazon. It's on my website, and it will be on Audible soon. I promise. Well, I, I really hope it is. What's the title so people know what Antonia, to search? Antonia, it's the Antonia Cinebaldi story, colon, strength, fate, strength, and perseverance. Fate, strength, perseverance. That's a good and, okay. and, um, I, yeah, I want to share this podcast. I also was making a podcast, but you everything should. with the corona halted everything. Oh, well, you know what? A lot of people are doing podcasts because of the coronavirus because they're home and they're bored. So this might be the time for you to start. Think about it. So, yes. Mm -hmm. but tell, um, email me the link. I, I will. will share it. Yeah. Thank yeah, you. Tiffany, uh, we should I'll, do this more. Just as friends. I'd love to. It's super great to talk to you, Antonia. You're a, you're, you're a sweetheart. I wish I lived closer to you so we could actually hang out after the coronavirus is over, of course. Yeah. Okay, but have a great day, and please share this, and I will talk to you later. Hey, let me know when. I can I'll, share that. Oh, I will let you know. I'll talk to you on Facebook, but it'll be out there tomorrow. I'll give you Bye. Okay, see you later. Bye.